Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith, and we often talk, of course, about, you know, climate and weather and, you know, systems scale analysis. We don't talk about the oceans enough, and in the oceans, there's these um, analogous oceanic weather systems, basically the eddies and vortices and things. So there's mesoscale, medium scale eddies, and the atmospheric um, circulation, of course, drives, um, you know, the winds drive the ocean movement on the surface, and you get these different vortices formed. So this um, image, we've got the, um, the uh, North Atlantic here, we've got the South Atlantic here. There's these ocean weather systems, um, and there's these climate scale currents. The, the black lines are the climate scale currents, if you like. And uh, these ocean weather systems are formed and they can either be energized where the currents are, are converging or they can be weakened where the currents are diverging, the blue and the red is they're being energized. So in other words, energy is being put into the movement of the ocean with these uh, these uh, eddies, the mesoscale eddies are gaining energy. And there's a huge interaction of these ocean movements and energy transitions in the ocean that actually mirror the global atmospheric circulation and that are very important for the weather patterns that we see in the atmosphere. And it's really not discussed enough. So there's a new paper out just uh, late last year. Scientists uncover the link between ocean weather and the global climate using mechanical rather than statistical analysis. So by mechanical, we mean that the winds on the surface are pushing the water on the surface and that water by mechanical means, by stirring, etc., cetera, um, can um, push energy up to different scales. So in other words, a very, very small ocean patterns and ocean movement can feed energy into the larger um, eddies and those can feed energy into the larger gyres and so on, you know, in, in upscale energy transfer. And there can also be downscale energy transfer from the larger ocean gyres down to the eddies, down to the smaller ocean movement. So an international team of scientists has found the first direct evidence linking seemingly random weather systems in the ocean with climate on a global scale. So this work's done at the University of Rochester, interestingly enough, the Department of Mechanical Engineering and also uh, staff scientists, physicists, I'm guessing, at the university's laboratory for laser energetics. Okay, so people from various um, scientific fields trying to apply their knowledge to what's going on at the oceans and climate. So the oceans have weather patterns like what we experience on land, but they're on different time and length scales. Okay, so often they're on much larger time scales because the, you know, the ocean, does, the water doesn't move as fast, obviously, as the atmospheric uh, air currents. And uh, also they're on different length scales. Okay, so, you know, you can have huge synoptic weather systems spreading, you know, over, hundred, hundred, over you know, thousand kilometers in the oceans, you'll have much smaller length scales typically. Okay, so the lead author is um, studies uh, turbulence and complex, complex flows um, in systems. A weather pattern on land might last a few days and be about 500 kilometers wide, while oceanic weather patterns such as swirling eddies last for three to four weeks, but they're about one fifth the size. So they're, you know, about 100 and 100 to 125 kilometers in size. Okay, but they're analogous to the, the atmospheric patterns. 
Scientists have long speculated that these ubiquitous, so you see them everywhere in the ocean, and seemingly random motions in the ocean, they communicate with climate scales, but it's always been, there's a connection with climate in the atmosphere, but it's always been vague because it wasn't clear how to disentangle this complex system to measure their interactions. So this paper, this new work develops a framework to do that. What they found was not what people were expecting because it requires the mediation of the atmosphere. So the atmosphere is key in, in what's going on in the oceans and vice versa. So the group wanted to understand how energy actually passed through different channels in the ocean throughout the planet. They used a mathematical method um, developed in 2019. It was implemented into an advanced code and it was done for other, other, other studies basically, which allowed them to look at the energy transfer across different patterns, ranging from the circumference of the globe, which is 40,000 kilometers, uh, down to 10 kilometers. So across all different scales. So they applied these techniques to ocean data sets um, from an advanced climate model and also from satellite observations of what the ocean was doing. And they found that the ocean weather systems are both energized and weakened with in, when interacting with climate scales and in a pattern that mirrors the global atmospheric circulation. The atmospheric band near the equator called the Intertropical Convergence Zone or ITCZ, it produces about 30% you know, just under one third of global precipitation. It causes an intense amount of energy transfer and it produces turbulence in the ocean. So it feeds lots of energy into the ocean. So looking at the complex fluid motion patterns of the oceans at multiple scales is not easy, but it has advantages over previous attempts to link weather to climate change. And it lets us understand the climate system better, these interactions between the climate and the ocean, the atmosphere and the ocean. There's a lot of interest, of course, in how global warming and our changing climate is influencing extreme weather events, right? This is vitally important, the changes in the jet streams, etc. Usually such research efforts are based on statistical analysis that requires huge amounts of data to have confidence in the uncertainties to lower the uncertainty with more and more data. But here they look at the mechanistic approach, the actual mechanical connections, the way that energy is transferred from the atmosphere to the oceans. Um, and that helps them look at um, the cause and effect more easily. Okay, so that's the, um, that's the paper. That's the article about the paper. Um, just have a look at um, some things here. Um, there's lots of information on, uh, this is a PBS uh, site on how ocean currents work and how they're, how we're breaking them. And, uh, you know, you can have a look at, um, basically, you can get, look at the large scale ocean currents, like the, the, that circumvent the planet. And actually, I'm not going to go too, into too much detail on it, but basically, um, you know, the ocean conveyor system, right? We know, you know, that it's caused, it's called the thermohaline circulation. So a lot of the flow is by sinking water that's heavier. Um, so it depends on, you know, thermo, the heat of the water and uh, saline, uh, the, 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 uh, the salt of you know, the water, you know, the density of the water, it affects, it affects uh, how buoyant it is and, you know, you know, water sinks at the poles down into the abyss and so on. Okay, so, um, but there's more to it than that. The wind moves water at the surface and that energy can, um, you know, the energy goes into turbulence of the ocean at the surface and that turbulence can be upscaled to eddies, you know, hundreds of kilometers, 100, say 100, 125 kilometers in diameter, and then that energy can be upscaled into gyres, uh, which are much, much larger, covering ocean basins, and then that some of that energy can feed into the, the uh, thermohaline circulation system, okay, the heat salt um, circulation, so the global overall ocean circulation. 
So it's um, it's interesting. So Earth circumference, yeah, forty thousand kilometers. So that's the upper scale of the uh, you know the ocean uh, gyres and eddies that we look at, and also the study looks down to resolve things down to ten kilometers. So if you look at global atmospheric circulation system, I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, about that system. And if I expand on on this um, on this uh, schematic here, just to remind you, this is the ITCZ, the intertropical convergence zone. You know, so this is the equator here. Um, if it's we're in the northern summer, the ITCZ moves up north of the equator. In the southern summer, it moves south. Um, the amount of intense rainfall, 30% of all rainfall on the planet is in this band here, here, excuse me. And the rain falling and the downward currents, um, the downward air currents with the rain uh, basically uh, stir up the ocean and add energy to the ocean here. Um, we, because of the rotation of the earth and the, you know, we get the Hadley cell here hot air rises then it moves towards the uh towards the uh, pole and then sinks down at about 30 degrees and recycles back so this is the hadley cell and like gears the um the downward motion here occurs and you get a gear which is a feral cell and then the polar cell so the hadley is between zero and 30 the polar, the, the feral is between 30 and 60, and between 60 and 90 is the polar cell. And the height of the atmosphere, um, the troposphere, is actually, what, about 17 kilometers near the equator and about 7 kilometers here. So as we go north, the air gets colder and these cells are flattened on top. And uh, you can actually, so you get basically a low pressure area at the equator. Then you get a high pressure area where the air is descending down and then you get a low pressure area at 60 degrees and then a high pressure area here and then because of the rotation of the earth and the Coriolis you get the northeasterly trades, southeasterly trades, um, the westerlies, uh, westerlies at mid-latitude which we all know about living in the northern hemisphere most of us. Okay, the prevailing patterns. So you get all this circulation. Um, and uh, the important thing is, is that the, the air rising here, you know, between, because of these gears of the, the two Hadleys in the two hemispheres, you get hot air rising up here, um, which actually generates them. So you get a convergence of water because you get, you know, you get the hot air rising up and it kind of creates a low pressure and pulled, the water gets pulled in. So you get convergence of the water. Um, when you get convergence, that can shrink and cause down energy to move in the downscale direction. Um, here you get um, the, the air is descending down onto the ocean surface, creating a high pressure area. But the air descending down, it pushes the water apart. It increases the scale of the eddies. Um, and that's an upscaling process, bringing energy from lower um, spatial current patterns to higher spatial current patterns. It changes the order of magnitude of the scale. So you get energy moving across from different, um, different ocean current eddies and eddy patterns and so on. Uh, you can look at the ocean ice energy cascade, it's known as, and you can see that uh, you know, energy is basically moving. So we've got very large scales here, a thousand kilometer scales of currents. These are the, the very large eddies in the ocean. You get a hundred kilometer uh, eddies, which are the mesoscale eddies. And then you get uh, stuff even on smaller scales. So if you're moving from, if you're moving energy from the very large to smaller, you're downscaling. And if you're moving energy um, from the other way, then you're upscaling and you could get a cascading of energy from one scale to another scale. Okay, so that's uh, the idea of energy cascading. And an octave is a factor of two. So moving an octave in music, it's corresponding to a doubling of frequency. So if you're moving from one scale up an octave, then you would move to, a du to doubling the scale. Okay, so those are some of the points 
Um, and then there's something called Ekman flow. So if you get the wind blowing this way, because of the Coriolis, the water current at the very surface would move this way at an angle from the wind. And then this water moving on the surface drags the water below uh, with it, but because of the Coriolis, it gets shifted off a little bit in direction. And this water drags this water, so the shift is this way. So the direction of the water movement varies as you go down the water column and it goes to zero at about, uh, say, about the order of 100 meters. Okay, so this is a mechanism to get water moving down to, you know, the top 100 meters of, of the ocean. It's very important for coastlines upwelling and downwelling. Okay, so those are some factors that um, it's important to sort of at least be aware of. And now we'll actually look at the actual uh, research paper, which is peer reviewed and published in the journal in, a, in the Science Advances Journal of ocean, you know, for of oceanography. Okay, so global cascade of kinetic energy in the ocean and the atmospheric imprint. That's the title of the paper. So they present an estimate of the ocean's global scale transfer of kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, of course, is the energy of motion as opposed to potential energy, which is stored energy. So they look at scales from 10 kilometers to 40,000 kilometers, which is a circum the, the circumference of the Earth. So oceanic kinetic energy transfer between the gyre scales. So this is a thousands of kilometer scale. You know, think of the big, huge ocean gyres, five of them in the main oceans where the uh, plastic is being collected. Okay, those are the main big gyres. And so transfer of energy from those to the mesoscales, which are the the eddies that are, you know, 100 on the order of 100 kilometers, 120 kilometers or so. These, um, the energy transfer goes from one of these ocean movements to the other, um, and it's induced by the atmosphere's Hadley, Farrell, and polar cells. And the intertropical convergence zone induces an intense downscale kinetic energy transfer. Upscale transfer peaks at 300 gigawatts of energy across mesoscales of 120 kilometer in size. So these are mesoscale eddies. Um, so they get most of the energy, actually. The peak of the energy is in these 120 kilometer uh, size diameter eddies on the surface of the ocean. Roughly, the, roughly one third of the energy input by winds into the oceanic general circulation, right? The, the AMOC and the other large ocean circulation patterns, they get one third of the energy from winds that are driving these mesoscale eddies, which then feed energy into the oceanic general circulation. So this is really interesting ocean science. Nearly three quarters of this cascade occurs south of 15 degrees south, okay, and penetrates almost the entire water column. Okay, so the effect of these mesoscale eddies goes deep down into the water column. The effect of the, the huge gyres, the thousand kilometer scale gyres, is only affecting the, the upper, the very upper surface of the ocean. The mesoscale cascade of energy has a similar, self-similar seasonal cycle. Uh, it, there's a lag time of about 27 days per octave of length scales. Um, so basically, the we get most of the transfer of energy across 50 kilometer um, scale size eddies in the spring. And then it's 27 days per octave. So the energy gets transferred to the 100 kilometer scale size eddies um, in 27 days. And then you double that again in another 27 days. So we go from 50 to 100 to 200 kilometer scale size. Okay, and then in another 27 days, an additional 27 days, you get 400 kilometer scale. So you get from 20, you get from 50 kilometers to about 500 kilometers in about three months. 
Okay, so that happens. It get the energy gets to the 500 kilometer scale eddies in the summer, which is about three months later than the spring. The kinetic energy of these mesoscale eddies follows the same cycle, but it peaks about 40 days after the peak cascade. So energy is transferred across a scale, um, is primarily deposited uh, at a scale four times longer. So basically, you know, it's 27 days, 27 days, it's about 54 days. That's, you know, a little bit more, it's not quite 40, but it's about four times. So the energy mostly goes from say 50 kilometers eddy, eddy scale to 200 kilometer eddy, or, or to, yeah, to 200, to four times higher. Okay, so now that I've thoroughly confused you, let's look at some of the figures. So thoroughly confused myself maybe too. So oceanic general circulation is a central component of the Earth's climate system. If we didn't have ocean general circulation, much of the Earth's surface would be covered by ice, right? Because we wouldn't have energy being carried from the equator to the poles. So the poles would basically freeze and the ice would, would extend quite far down south. So the ocean circulation spreads the heat, you know, from the, the uh, equator, which gets much more solar insulation, uh, to the poles. And it's also done in the atmosphere, of course. This ocean circulation comprises motion spanning a wide range of structures and scales from the order of a thousand kilometers. Okay, this is the, the, the big ocean gyres. The O, funny looking O, capital O, scripted O is on the order of, okay, 10,000 kilometers down to the order of one millimeter, okay? So, so the, the, the motion is in all these different scales. It includes coherent jets, it's calling them jets, but you know, we're talking about the Gulf Stream and the Kuroshio, very fast movements of water. The, these are the gyres, the, the part, part of the main gyre system, and the meridional overturning circulation on basin scales several thousands of kilometer in, in extent. So the big ocean basins, right? The large scale ocean current images that uh, you often see. Ocean circulation also includes turbulent mesoscale eddies on the order of 100 kilometer in size. Okay, most of the energy is going in at uh, that uh, 120 kilometer in size, and we're talking about huge amounts of energy, 300 gigawatt, gigawatts, and that's where the energy transfer peaks going into these mesoscale eddies. So these pervade, these are all across the global ocean and contain most of the energy's kinetic energy. It's in these 120 kilometer an hour uh, turbulent, um, gy you know, little, little, little rotation of water in those areas on the surface, and then it extends down to depth. So mesoscale eddies are the ocean's equivalent of weather systems. They have characteristic time scales of a few months, so they last, their lifetime is a couple few months. Because of their energy and chaotic nature, Recent studies have suggested that these eddies may play a substantial role in climate variability that is intrinsic to the ocean and is distinct from variability due to external forcing of the ocean. So the oceanic therm internal variability is hypothesized to arise because energy can be transferred between seemingly incoherent mesoscale eddies and a larger scale Co coherent flow. Okay, so we've got all these 120 kilometer diameter movements of water, circular movements of water, these eddies, and energy can be transferred from them to the larger scale uh, gyres that are on the order of thousands, thousands of, of kilometers. Okay, um, so there's direct evidence that, that such energy transfer goes and occurs. This kinetic energy cascade is a fundamental process in turbulent flows with profound and far-reaching consequences to the Earth's climate and including, you know, our, our everyday lives. This cascade allows the transfer of energy between vastly different length scales and is still an active research area. 
Because the oceanic circulation on scales on the order of 100 kilometers and larger is predominantly geostrophic, similar to two-dimensional 2D flows, it's theoretically predicted to transfer kinetic energy upscale. However, these theories have been formulated for idealized homogeneous turbulence without boundaries. Flow in the ocean is very complex and homogeneous. So you can get upscaling and downscaling and also, you know, continental boundaries affect ocean currents, the bottom topography, the winds at the surface, and there's lots of other processes. Okay, so the question, some of the questions that they looked at in this paper, and I'll get to the figures in a minute, how important is the upscale cascade pathway of kinetic energy from the mesoscales of sizes on the order of 100 kilometers? How does it compare to other energy sources and sinks in the overall oceanic circulation? Answering these questions is important to determine the energy cascade's potential contribution to climate variability. And I've already given the punchline here about, uh, about a third of the energy is is transferred roughly one third of the energy input by winds into these mesoscale eddies ends up powering the oceanic general circulation okay so they talk about previous work and they talk about uh things that they've done to uh that weren't done before uh, they talk about the importance on the gyre scales, the kinetic energy scale transfer shows signatures of the global atmospheric circulation patterns like the Hadley, the Farrell, and the polar cells uh, create basically, you know, there's five latitudinal bands. We're talking about the equator is one. We're talking about 30 north, 30 south is two, where the Hadley and Farrell meet. And, we're, and, then, and then four and five are the 60 degree north and south latitudes where between the feral and the polar cells. And I've already mentioned how the high pressure bands, you know, where the winds are driving up from the surface at the equator, that's pulling water together, uh, causing it, causing the eddies, that's transferring eddies from larger scale to smaller scale, right? Downscaling energy cascading. And then the opposite effect where the winds are converging on the surface, creating high pressure at the surface, like at 30 degrees north, 30 degrees south. Um, we're talking about energy going from smaller motions, like the mesoscale eddies, to larger motions, like the gyre eddies. So this is upscaling. And when we talk about an octave, and we're talking about the distance, you know, 50 kilometers up an octave is 100 kilometers, and you know, so on, just like the, the music scale, the octave scale. Okay, the energy, the atmosphere is intertropical convergence zone, produces a band of intense downscale kinetic energy transfer in the ocean near the equator. So you can calculate, uh, you know, basically, it, you know, they, they find that these mesoscales, the energy in these mesoscales penetrates the entire water column, whereas the circulation at the gyre scales on, you know, 1,000 kilometers weakens notably with depth. They also report the first estimate of 300 gigawatts going into the, uh, for the global upscale cascade of mesoscale kinetic energy. So, so 300 gigawatts from these mesoscales, the kinetic energy in these 120 kilometer, you know, on the order of 100 kilometer um, uh, size uh, diameter ed eddies. This is so this is a huge amount of energy and you know there's a delay of 27 days per octave for the energy being transferred so the kinetic energy transfer peaks across 50 kilometer peaks eddies in the spring and about across 500 kilometer peaks about three months later because you know you need to double 50 double it again to 100 double it again to 200 that takes three times 27 days um, and then add a few days. So it goes to, so this is about three months delay. Okay, uh, so anyway, this is, uh, you know, this is what they're finding. Um, and they look at the spectra, the, the energy spectra. They talk about, they, they, the, the figures mostly look at, uh, they look at the global ocean they look at the global ocean north of 15 degrees north. They call that north of tropics. They look at the tropics between 15 south and 15 north, right, bracketing the equator. 
and they look at the south of tropics, south of 15 degrees latitude south. Um, and basically they, uh, they okay, so, so let's have a look uh, at the figures. What else do I need to say? Okay, I'm not going to talk about some of these other details. Let's have a look at the, the plot. So what they show here, this is the kinetic energy spectrum. You know, joules per square meter, millions of joules per square meter is on this scale here. Okay, logarithmic scale. They look at the tropics. So this is from minus 15 south to 15 north. And they look at the uh, the length scale here. This is the, uh, this is the um, L... Uh, this symbol, L of the Earth, is the equatorial circumference of the Earth, 40,000 40, kilometers, right? This is a logarithmic scale, and you can see how the energy is distributed across the different length scales. Um, this, is, uh, this, is the, this is 100 kilometers, roughly where the mesoscale eddies are. Uh, these are the gyres, and then, uh, you know, the, the, the band of, you know, this is uh, the... This is starting to get, well, a thousand kilometers, 10,000 kilometers, you know, the largest gyres filling ocean basins. And you can kind of see the, the energy spectrum at the different regions. And you can see the, this, the depth is um, on this scale. So you can see, uh, you know, in each different situation, what happens with depth. And basically, when you're talking about the the uh, mesoscale eddies, uh, the, there's a, the curves are much tighter together here. Energy goes down through the depths. Whereas when you come over here to the much larger scale, the energy is mostly confined up in the top regions. It doesn't go down that, that deep. Okay, so you can look at the gyre. You know, this is at the gyre scale where the length is about, characteristic length is about a thousand kilometers in diameter. Okay, uh, and then this is the meso scales. We're talking about 120 kilometer in diameter. And you can see where the energy is going in. And uh, you can, this is divided, this is January, February, March, July, August, September, and the full year. And you can see how, you know, there's a big seasonal component of the energy. So this is the energy, this is where the ITCZ would be. So this is the, summer in the southern hemisphere so the itcz is south of the equator and you can see these areas here um and the different colors are the um the th this is basically the 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 downscaling and upscaling of kinetic energy okay um so the positive values are a downscaling of kinetic energy so from the, the, the larger scale to the smaller scale sizes, size eddies, and the blue is the opposite. The blue, the negative values of, the, um, of, the, of, of this uh, cascading term uh, are show the, um, are, are the blue, show, show the upscale. So the negative values are the upscaling. Okay, so basically you have energy being transferred mostly in these regions here, okay, uh, near the equator. And this is, again, due to the ITCZ. Um, and there's some more figures showing, uh, this is the a full year, this is the January, February, March, and uh, this is f for, uh, this, this again is the same component here the, the same value here, the, the strength of the kinetic energy scale transfer, the cascade, the energy. So it shows, so energy is basically shifting, uh, you know, in the ocean, in different region, in some reason, it's shifting from the, the 120 kilometer eddies to larger uh, gyres. And in other regions, it's shifting from the gyres to the eddies, whether it's upscaling or downscaling for the different colors in different regions different latitudes and so on. And with depth, uh, you can see the, uh, this is the 120 kilometer uh, diameter mesoscale eddies. The energy can actually go quite far down into the, deep into the ocean is what it's showing. So, so all of these things are showing basically 
um, the uh, you know how energy is moved at different scales in in the ocean um, and, and at different latitudes okay and uh, there's seasonality uh, that occurs um, there's there's different seasonal trends that occur you know the monsoons the Indian monsoons have a big effect the ITCZ has a big effect the um, the Antarctic uh, circumpolar currents those ocean currents have have a big effect um, and an imprint you know the Hadley cell the feral cell the polar cells of the atmosphere have different effects too on the ocean so you know it's important to have a look at the whole system you know not just consider the uh, effect of, of global warming climate change on the atmospheric circulation but also the way that energy gets transferred to the ocean is very important and the way that the ocean um, distributes that energy among the different motions um, but you know the different uh, scales of the water movements is very important and feeds back and affects the the climate so there's uh this is uh interesting this is this is the kinetic energy cascade in gig gigawatts so cascade energy moving from one scale to another scale um and it shows how it's divided among the different parts of the ocean so in globally in the ocean, you can see these red curves here and lo and behold, the peak um, of the, the red curves or the, the, the shallowest part of the dip is at 120 kilometers length. This is the mesoscale eddies and you can see it's, it's uh, the, well, the red curve, the, the midpoint is 300 gigawatts. So this is the peak. This is the part, this is the, where most of the energy goes uh, from the, into the oceans, into those mesoscale eddies. It's where most of the energy is carried and it can be, uh, you know, when you upscale it, it goes to much larger length scales. And about, a, so it provides about a third of the energy they show into the, the mainstream ocean circulation patterns and talk, you know, the Crocio current, the AMOC, etc. So they get a tremendous amount of energy from these um, these eddies, which get the energy from the the atmosphere. You know the the different uh, atmospheric movements and the winds on the surface of the ocean blowing. Okay, so basically what this study does is it looked at it analyzed the scale dynamics of the ocean. Um, and it created the first global maps of the kinetic energy cascade in the ocean. So how energy is transferred through different types of ocean eddies and gyres, et cetera, in the ocean. The, the transfer of the oceanic kinetic energy across gyre scales revealed a prominent imprint of the atmosphere's Hadley, Farrell, and polar circulation cells. So those are vital for where the energy is going into the ocean through the five, especially at the five uh, latitudinal bands of alternating upscale and downscale kinetic energy transfer. So remember where the winds are blowing down, creating high pressure at the surface, they're actually uh, moving energy, they're upscaling energy to larger scales of motion and when the energies are you know where, where the uh, winds are moving up you know strong convection creating low pressure at the surface it's drawing in water and it's causing a downscale of kinetic energy transfer so they showed that the gyre scale transfer occurs because of kinetic energy exchange with these mesoscale eddies and uh, they, they basically look at how the energy is transferred. They found that the atmosphere's ITCZ produces a narrow latitudinal band of intense downscale transfer of energy. And there's a seasonal meridional shift in the north-south direction, right, of the ITCZ with seasons. And so the, this downscaling transfer in the ocean follows, just follows the ITCZ. Um, they quantified uh, the idea of the Ekman transport and, and the role of that in the kinetic energy scale transfer. 
um, in different parts of the ocean surface. The Traditionally, the Ekman transport has been inferred only indirectly from wind stress, um, but but they uh, showed that there was energy exchange between the different gyre scales in the ocean and the mesoscales. And uh, they explained it using some sort of, they call it a piston pressure framework that is unorthodox in physical oceanography. Um, okay, so they looked at the scale transfer of kinetic energy across scales ranging from 10 kilometers to the circumference of the Earth, 40,000 kilometers. They got the first estimate of the global oceanic cascade of kinetic energy, which has a peak upscale transfer rate of 300 gigawatts. This is from the, the mesoscale eddies to the much larger scale oceanic global circulation um, patterns. Um, <clears throat> and there's a significant fraction uh, about of the wind power that drives the oceanic general circulation and constitutes a previously unquantified source in the global energy budget of the ocean's mesoscales between 100 and 500 kilometers in size. Okay, uh, so they they looked at uh, you know they looked at four years of velocity data in the ocean, three and a half decades of the different scale sizes. Um, 50 different depth levels in the ocean. So, so basically, they they uh, you know expanded the 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 the, the research, cutting edge research on on motion, water motion in the oceans. And uh, you know they basically found uh, the you know time scales of the motion: 27 days to get per octave. Um, 40 days out of phase, um, so the kinetic energy transferred across any mesoscale distance is primarily deposited at a scale four times larger. And uh, yeah, so so they basically they they and then they argue about the importance that like of the energy transfer in the ocean between the mesoscale eddies and the larger coherent ocean circulation, the gyres, etc., uh, is very important for intrinsic ocean variability and therefore climate variability. Um, and that needs to be studied a lot more. I mean, 300 gigawatts of transfer is, is uh, you know, can probably play, is probably playing a meaningful role in climate dynamics. So we can understand what's going on with the climate and weather patterns, you know, by studying the oceans more, because there's a, there's a there's a deep connection between between the two things. Okay, um, so there's uh, you know this is very a rudimentary estimate shows that a net increase of a mere 0.3 gigawatts, 0.1 percent of the 300 gigawatts in kinetic energy transfer to gyre scales of a major circulation pattern can be momentous. Okay, so very, <laughs> right, a change, you know, very small change in the amount of energy being transferred through what, you know, as climate change proceeds will have a huge impact on, on weather patterns, for example. You know, for example, in the case of the Antarctic circumpolar circulation, um, about 10 centimeters per second gyre scale over a scale of 10 to the cube kilometers, 1,000 kilometers speed, a variation would, this variation would result in a 10% speed increase over 10 years and over a volume of 10 to the 8 cubic kilometers. Okay, this would be a considerable speed up, order a factor of 10 times the observed acceleration. So this is the idea of, you know, very small changes in, in one system can, can lead to huge changes in the overall climate system. Okay, so this is very important for learning more about climate variability. Um, also, the gyre circulation can change quite quite a bit, and uh, there there is an important role of the mesoscale eddies, much larger than we thought, and these penetrate the entire water column. So this couples to the the ocean surface to deeper circulation patterns, right? So 
there's a lot of stuff in in this paper, but um, you know this is an area that needs to be studied in a lot more detail um, because it can have huge ramifications on on our global climate system and weather patterns. So basically, you know, ignore the oceans at at our peril. Anyway, it's, it's uh, there's a lot in this paper. I obviously have to reread it a bunch more times and try to figure out more details myself because it's it's uh, it's not easy to to understand. But uh, anyway, I hope uh, you know I've helped explain some things. Please consider going to my website paulbeckwith.net and clicking on my PayPal to support my research and videos. Thanks again. Bye for now.